Welcome to the very first episode of the Focus TV's Roundtable. We've been talking about this for quite a while. We're so happy that, you know, one, today's here. Go ahead and get this going. Um, we want this to be an informative space where we talk about real topics that, you know, matter within the world of sports. We're so happy that one of our first guests today is Lewis Hinton, UMass Lowell assistant coach, played at Boston College. He was a point guard from 2002 to 2006. Lewis, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. I appreciate you guys for having me. Oh, man, looking forward to it. I know Cardell can't, can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so we want, wanted to talk about recruiting today just because it's one of those things where there's a dis disconnect if you're on the outside just looking in, mm -hmm. um, just from all sides because everybody has kind of like a take on it or a perspective that aren't always necessarily involved in it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of we want to take this chance, as Cardell presented it to me, that where we just want to have a good discussion put everything on the table, and try to get to this place where it's easier for everybody to understand your side of it, the parent side of it, the player side of it. That being said, uh, what's like the most challenging part of recruiting, of the recruiting process as it pertains for you? Uh, I would say right now with so much changing with the dates and mm -hmm. when's the live period and where can we go, right now it's understanding um, where the schedule's going and um, when and how much can you see kids. Um, you know, usually when you're out on the road, I would say that the next toughest thing is probably getting to know as much about the kid as possible because you got to understand once you get them, hopefully they're yours for four years. So you kind of want to know, you know, what their habits are off the right. court, good or bad practice habits, how do they treat their parents. Um, their closest friends, you know, things like that. Because eventually, once you get them on campus and you have to deal with them all, every day, that stuff is going to rear its head. So um, you want to just understand, like, what are you able to deal with? What are some non-negotiables for you and your program? And, and then go from there. All right, Cardo. When you find out the dates and you finally get to the gym and recruit, what are some things you're looking for? Because now you know it's a main AAU team, mm -hmm. and every coach thinks their player is Division One as well as the parents. And definitely the players. Mm -hmm. So what is the thing you look for to be like, all right, he can play at this level? Well, for, first, I would say, like, body language, you okay. know, stuff like that. Uh, for the most part, we all got a job because we can evaluate talent. We mm -hmm. can understand basketball, things like that. But, like I said, you know, you're going to have these guys every day. And it's like, you know, I take it serious about, guy got an 8 o'clock game. Like, was he there on time? Mm -hmm. Is he competing? I know every day may not be your best game, especially, you know, some of these tournaments you're talking about playing five, six games in a two-day span. Mm -hmm. Every game is not going to be your best game. Sometimes you're going to fatigue. But I'm like, man, this kid's getting after it. He's still competing. I think he's good. I saw him play yesterday three games, so I believe in his ability. But does he take this serious all the time? And, um, again, season gets long. You're going to go through peaks and valleys. Um, are you, are you going to attack it every single day and just try to be the best player you can? Um, and usually those guys, they end up panning out, so. What are the immediate turnoffs when you like, I'm good, you get up and walk away? Again, late, um, just late to a game. Obviously, for me, again, I don't know you yet to right. really know how you are as a kid, so I can only go by what I see in this short time span. So if you're late, I'm just assuming you don't value my time as much as you value your own time or the team's time or your teammates' time, um, things like that. Like I said, are you going to compete at 8 in the morning? Because it's – I just have a philosophy of if you'll quit on this, there is no telling when – like it's, it's in your DNA. Like right. you'll, you'll quit. You know, I just don't know when it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> is it going to be when we're down 10 trying to claw back? Is it going to be when you haven't hit a shot and now you're just like, oh, forget this, like – um, but to me, it's in your DNA and it's in there somewhere. Like, eventually he'll quit on you. So. <laughs> All right, one of the things we talk about so many times on The Focus, uh, people in these highlight tapes, people love them. Some people live by them, think they're the end all, be all, the holy grail mm -hmm. to getting to the next level. Obviously being a bit facetious here, but just how much do, you know, the social media highlight tapes mm -hmm. matter? If not, because we just want it. We've had people in your position say this before. Want to just take it again to hammer this home. Um, so the two different mixtapes. You have the <laughs> the huddles, yeah. you know, the huddle accounts, things like that, which pretty much gets a grasp of your whole season. When you're talking about the social media mixtape, it's if you ever been at some of these tournaments, like it's crazy to see 
The kids are playing so much after the whistle. So you do something. I file you at half court, and they're going to still go and do something because the guy's under the basket with the camera. So a lot of times, unless you're there, you don't realize, like, 10 of these plays did not happen when the game was actually going. Um, you know, I, I've seen guys do dunk contests after the game. Like, you know, you talk about switching over between, you know, AAU games, so you got to get off so the next teams can get on. And they're going to go and do three, four dunks because they know it's going to get on the social media mixtape. So um, as far as, like, where that stands in recruiting, it is good to capture the eye, but I'll always say, yeah, you got my attention. Can you send me three or four full games? Right. Um, anytime. I, people shoot 97% in, 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 in the highlight tape. Yep. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the ones that they do miss, they cut it out right before it happens. You know what I mean? So – um, you can look at that type of stuff and just kind of use it as a gauge. Oh, he can do these things. He can do these things. It looks good, but I need three or four full games um, to kind of really see what you do in game situations, and then we go from there. Right. And to piggyback off the, I mean, what is your take on now? They're filming warm-ups as, they're filming warm-ups as like a highlight tape and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm like, what's the whole point of that? You mm. know, and, and some of these players are not even going to play. It, it's all for, like I said, social media recognition, um, which – you know, we're, we're older than, you know, the, than the players that we're talking about, but for them is everything. Um, you know, even some of my players, I'm like, why'd you have to tweet that? Why'd you have to, why'd you get involved in that topic? It's all because, well, it's going to get likes. It's going to get clicked on. I got 20 extra followers out of that. Um, and it's so much validation for them that anything that they can have posts put out on social media they're going to do it. So I don't put much stock into it <laughs> at all. The whole dunk and then everybody jumps right before yeah. we go in oh, the yeah, huddle yeah, yeah. and, okay. you know, things like that. But for them, it's, it, it means a lot to them. Um, I mean, all, I think it means too much to them because it's all fake. Yeah. It's, not, it's nothing real about it. Um, amongst coaching circles, and I'm, you, I know you do this and you guys are pretty tied in, but I would say – 50% of the offers you see out there aren't real. Yeah. You know, like... I had a question about that a little they bit. they just throw it out there, blessed to have such and such and such and such. Like, you know, then you start talking amongst coaches. It's like, no, like, we called the guy. Like, we called him. Like, I'm showing some interest. Yeah. They're not offering, like, anything. But um, social media. Like, if you don't mind, since you brought that up, mm -hmm. um, can you explain that process of... Uh, like, you know, issuing out an offer? Mm -hmm. um, for me and the way that we do it at UMass Lowell, um, our coach has the utmost, you know, respect and belief in what we can do as evaluators of, of talent and some of these young kids. Um, but at the same time, you know, you'll take a look at verbal commits. We don't throw out a bunch of offers because personally I wanted to feel important to the kid. Um, if you go look at verbal commits, it kind of tells you what you got. So I'm like, okay, we got one scholarships and 37 offers out there. Like, does that feel special to the kid? Like, to know? Serious, yeah. Right. So for, for, for us, and I don't even like to get into it. Like, I prefer the entire staff to get a look at kids. That's how we do it. Hey, I like this kid. I'm going to get my three or four game films that I, t that I talked about. Hey, all of you guys watch it. Let me know what you think. Okay, everybody's on board. Mm. Let's offer the kid. Gotcha. Versus me just being an assistant at whatever uh, tournament. I'm there by myself. I like them. Head coach hasn't even seen them yet. And then you throwing offers out there that, you know, aren't really real unless the head coach signs off on it. And that's another thing I try to tell kids. When I really like a kid, it's, hey, man, let me get you on the phone with my head coach. Because it ain't real until, you know, he signs off on it and he says, you know, let, this is the kid. Let's go get him. So that's kind of you start recruiting. What are the dialogue with parents? Because you, you get all types of crazy stories, mm -hmm. but you know, sometimes it can be misleading. Sometimes parents are real cool. They mm -hmm. just want to get a feel for who you are. And basically, are you going to take care of my kid? You know what I'm saying? But you also have the crazy parents. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say no names who, you know, make national headlines saying, yo, my, my son, gonna, he, needs, he needs to start. They make demands. Mm -hmm. So what has been your experience with, you know, parents? For the most part, parents have, have been great. Um, you know, you get to, you know, certain situations. And it, like I said, it could be a life-changing experience for a kid, for, for a family who, you know, if you have college aspirations for your kid, you know, take sports out of it. I've been 
saving up for the last however many years to make this dream a reality. And I think from our standpoint, you're talking low to mid majors. Um, some of the kids that we recruit, you don't know what's going to happen until it happens. Uh, I'm not speaking for the kid that's going to Duke or North Carolina. You probably think from the ninth, 10th grade, they kind of know that they're going to be a college basketball player. So you come in and, you know, you, so to speak, change some of these kids' lives. I'm like, man, I've been working my life uh, to get here. Um, a parent may have been saving up, you know, for something for college to realize, oh, well, now that's a nest egg because he's going to school for free um, and things like that. And I, I think for the most part, um, parents are great. You know, for me, I just try to get to know the family, the siblings. I try to get to know everybody um, as, as well as I can. Um, I go to their homes, I sit in their living room. I do all that kind of stuff because, again, I'm not a parent yet, but I can only imagine what it's like to turn your kid over to somebody else and they're going hundreds of miles away mm -hmm. basically for four years like you could probably come home in the summer for two 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 to three months and that's all you're going to see your kid for the next four years like i i would want to know yeah. what as much as i can about this coach this coaching staff mm -hmm. the players that are going to be around my kid your morals and values so i kind of understand any question or concern a parent may have every now and then you're going to run into the parent who is um overly confident in their kid. And again, I'm not a parent, so I can't sit here and tell you that I'm not going to be that. Like, right. you know, when the time comes that I'm just trying to instill this confidence in into my child. And for some people, I think it's the best thing in the world for them. Like, just to know I have somebody that really believes in me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I can even say this on camera, but I think you're going to have somebody on here that it's a great dynamic. Um of the relationship that they have and the confidence that one instills in the other to be the best, the best that he can be. Um, I think some coaches, you feel like it's a it's an obstacle or um, a hurdle to get around to get to the kid, but at the same time, it's like, why are you trying to go around it to get to the kid? You need to go through the parent to get to the kid. So that's kind of how I look at it. Um, and then at the end of the day, you, you just have to understand your university and what you can offer offer to a family or a kid and be as transparent with that as possible. If they see that as something that's value in their life, they're going to you know, accept it. If they don't, they don't. That's recruiting. You can't win them all. <laughs> Move on to the next one. Um, so that's kind of how I feel about parents. I think it's once in a blue moon where you get somebody that's overly involved. And typically, that's usually a parent that didn't play. Typically. Mm -hmm. um, to piggyback off that question, what, what, had, what did the dialogue with high school coaches? You know, it's different from when we came up. Like, mm -hmm. when we came up, high school coaches were still big. Like, mm -hmm. you, you got to go through them to get to the player mostly, and then pretty much second to the parent. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, they might not be a factor at all mm -hmm. if, if they behind a parent and AAU coaches. So, what are, what are the dialogue with the uh, high school coaches? I, I think that you're right. That has totally changed um, from when we were in yeah. school. But just to, from my background, I'm from the area, PG County, I went to Glen Park. I played at Boston College. I went overseas to play for eight years. And then I got right into coaching. So I never got into the AAU scene and this, that, and that. So all I knew was this, if this is how it's going to go, when you're recruiting a your kid, you have to go through the high school coach. So it was a total shock to me my <laughs> first year when it was like, uh, people don't really do that, or you call a coach and be like, "Man, the coach hasn't called me in years." And I'm like, "Well, how did they get your kid?" Like, mm -hmm. that's that's just the way that, right. as far as I remembered it, this is how it goes down. So um, I, I understand like the AAU thing has gotten bigger, um, but from a low major to a mid major standpoint, the worst that a coach can do to me is knock me out. As far as like I'm recruiting a kid and he says something bad, and he can knock me out. Um, so I go through those avenues just to make it, if you, just make it an even playing field. Gotcha. I feel like my ability to grow a relationship with your player is going to speak for itself. Just don't knock me out. So I will, I always reach out to the high school coach, the parents, the AAU coach. I ask the kid, the, one of the first questions that I ask is who is influential in your life? That's going to help you make this decision. Give me those list of people. I'm going to talk to them all because again, all you can, I feel like all you can do is knock me out. 
versus if it's an even playing field, I feel like it, I'm, it's, I'm pretty good. Like, I'll do what I got to do. I'll be where I need to be. I'll talk to whoever I got to talk to to put my university in the best uh, position possible to land the kid. Um, and if everything's an even playing field, that's all, I, that's all I'm looking for in the recruiting process. And talking to a high school coach and all those things is, is, is really big to just keep that playing field as even as possible. So. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you guys to another edition of the Focus TV. What you guys were just watching, we told you guys we, had, we were cooking up something new for a while. So that was about a good, you know, 12, 15 minutes of an hour-long episode, which was the first installment of the roundtable presented by us here at the Focus TV. I would like for you all, when you get a chance, get over to YouTube, be it Finest Mag, My Model Sports, check that out. And just want to thank the guests that we had on the first episode, being Lewis Hennett, uh, Jordan Harrison and his father, Rod Harrison and Jamal Hayward, which is the person who's responsible for the, our wonderful installments of 9450 Breakdown each and every week. So that said, we got a lot to talk about tonight. Well, we have some things to talk about tonight. <laughs> I can't even lie, you guys got some things to discuss tonight. Then we got some rapid fire, so. I, I guess I look forward to see what Cardell has for us in that regard. But we're going to get started with, um, you know, the NBA. We've been talking about it each and every week. We're literally at the point where one team is currently waiting to face their opponent in the NBA Finals. So I guess we can start there with the Golden State Warriors completing a sweep of the Portland Trailblazers. Um, before I, you know, before I hand it over to you guys to get your quick thoughts, just real quick, uh, a bit of history. With the sweep, Golden State joins the 1960 Celtics as the only team in league history to reach five consecutive finals. To throw some history on those Celtics to make sure this is clear, we cannot bring up Golden State without acknowledging that that addition of Boston made 10 consecutive trips. So why it is great that Golden State has reached five. Shout out to those, the Celtics of yesteryear for completing 10 consecutive trips. So, uh, back, but, back up that part. Stop trying to use to discredit the Celtics saying they didn't play in as many series as the Warriors. The War, I mean, the Boston Celtics didn't have as many players to go through in the NBA as well. As far as like, so they only dealt with the elite at that time. Mm -hmm. But you got guys now with 30 teams. You got to look at it that way. So it's hard to do regardless of who's in the league or who's not, how many teams it is or whatnot. It's still a standard of excellence that you know shouldn't be discredited at all. Yeah, and we got to get out of this habit of just discrediting anything that happened before, just just gotta stop. Like, shout out to the Warriors, and again, you cannot bring up the Warriors what they're doing. You know, bring out this bring up this reach of my recent milestone without acknowledging those who did it first, and you know, yes. double, double the times, uh, ten straight trips, crazy. But I'll tell you your thoughts on. Uh, you know, we talked a little about it earlier, but mm -hmm. your thoughts last night as that series came to an end. Um, just to first piggyback off of that, I just wish people would give credit where credit is due on both sides. The Celtics. 10 straight seasons, that's amazing. The Warriors, five straight seasons, that's amazing. Point blank period, both sides. Um, dang, I really thought Portland would do it. At least get over it. just just the one. But, uh, I mean, it's crazy because literally, like, every – just about every game of the series ended the exact same way. And I think that's what – gives me pause the most about the series that they weren't able to they weren't able to adjust they weren't able to make the adjustments that were needed to get them to the win for that one for for every game you know um because it only takes one game to kind of get you started not saying of course that even if they won last night that they would you know beat them in the entire series i definitely don't say that but it just kind of dis disheartened me that they weren't able to figure it out and at least get one. But on the other side of it, it's hats off to Golden State because a lot of people, I won't say a lot of people, but there were people who were just like, Katie's out, It's I don't know what they're going to do. It's a vibe. They've been playing lights out. They've been playing lights out, all this other stuff, and discredited the players that were there before Katie got there. So I think it was a great reminder for all those that did say that 
to think that they're they're not the team that they were before KD gets there. I just think KD just adds the cherry on top of them. He is that dog that they're going to need. It's not saying that they don't need him. But, you know, Steph played out of his mind. And as much as you want to give him all of the credit, you can't because, like, Draymond just played insane the entire time. And, like, we talked about him every, you know, all year. He has an endless motor that's going to keep him going the entire game. And you could see that as the game was progressing, as the series was progressing. And um, even shout outs to both Steph and Draymond for being the first two players on the same team to get a triple double in the Weapons Conference Finals. Like, they both ended up with triple doubles and the W, and they were down by 16, 17 points in the third quarter. And to just walk them back as, as well as they did, they didn't go outside themselves. They didn't play crazy. They didn't jack the ball. They didn't do anything else besides finally lock in and realize, I think, who they were and what they needed to do and what they needed to get done, and they did. Um, I think it's, you know, a stepping stone for the the Trailblazers. You know, hopefully they'll go back to the drawing board, see what they need to improve on. I still think they need, like, a, a really go-to wing to kind of take some pressure off of Dame and CJ to have to do everything. Um, hopefully when they get Nurkic back next year, maybe they'll be able to make a better push in the conference finals if they get back. But at this point, like, I don't want to hear anything from anybody. Go stays winning every year until somebody stops them. Like, that's how I feel at this point. I don't want to hear about Houston. I don't want to hear about nobody else until somebody beats them. Nope, they, y'all can't do it. It hasn't happened in the past five years. And, you know, even with the media reports, you know, about – Clay uh, being a free agent, KD being a free agent. You know, I really don't think either one of them are going anywhere. But crazier things have happened. But I just, I can't see it until something dramatically changes. Carlo, your thoughts on the series? I just think uh, the Warriors knew how to win. As simple as that. Um, They were built to win. Um, They did all the little things. They dominated in all the little areas that results in winning, what people tend to ignore because everybody – especially these days, center just focus on points and yeah. flash and stuff. Um, the Warriors dominated the series. They won a rebound battle in the series, um, averaging 49 to 40. They won an assist battle, averaging 29 to 24. They won a steals battle, averaging nine to a little under six for Portland. They won a blocks, nearly seven to nearly four for Portland. By being more efficient, scoring the ball. You know, they, were, they shot 49% to Portland's 42. Uh, from three-point range, they both retired at 36%. That's the only reason why Portland even got up. It was in the series, honestly, and free throw percentage. They won that. The Warriors won eight. They shot 81% to Portland, 77%. uh, And they're built to go this far. You could just tell the inexperience caught up with Portland. And people really don't think about matchups in the playoffs. Just because you hot during the regular season, you you, you got a great record, does not mean that you match up well with certain teams when Mm -hmm. it comes to the playoffs. And this is one team they just didn't match up well with. And what I figured would probably be sweet even without KD is because of their front court. There's no, really no production there. Look what Myers Leonard did. He had one great game. And that's not knocking him, but it was easy work for Draymond. You see what I'm saying? So he didn't really have to – all he had to do was just be himself, disrupt things. And it wasn't much to disrupt because those guys are not really skilled, but you have to really consider them a threat. You know, you can just throw the ball – not like if you was dealing with a Jokic or yeah. – uh, you know, like maybe an Aldridge in Portland or somebody like that where you really have to game plan for them. They, they're not those type of guys. Portland def- relies on Dame and CJ to carry that offensive load a lot. And then once, C- you know, Dame got hurt, and it's, you know, even though it just came out before the game, but once he got hurt, you know, you see that. And shout out to the Warriors defense. They don't give that enough credit. Mm-hmm. They, they, they said, damn, we, we damn sure ain't going to let Dame beat us. They, not, they, they threw – Long athletic wings on him. They saw what he'd been doing during the playoffs. They didn't even give him a chance to get off. They threw long athletic wings to just defend him straight up. Then as soon as he crossed half court, we're coming with Draymond or Iguodala or somebody longer. So now it's either you're going to force up bad shots or you have to get a ball up. Obviously, he's a, he's a poised player. He's going, I got to look for my teammates. His teammates didn't deliver. CJ did his thing, but Clay was on him, so he was pretty inefficient. So who else was going to step up? You see what I'm saying? So, and even when guys did step up like Myers Leonard or um, all that stuff like that, the Warriors just clamped down on him. You, you notice last night he had 24 in the first half. He finished with 30. So, in the second half, he didn't do nothing. They, all right, he going off. Let's turn our attention to him. They clamped him down. No one else could hit shots. And, and then the runs come. 
And the thing people don't understand, if you play basketball, you understand exactly what I'm about to say. When you're getting locked up and you can't score, and even if you're up and you're dealing with a potent offensive team that you know is capable of going off and they start hitting shots and you still can't score, that pressure gets real. I don't care if you're at home or not. You, mm-hmm. you, you feel it coming, and then by that time it's too late. You're checking out, and then you find guys playing out themselves. They're missing layups because they're pressing and stuff like that. And the other teams see it. That's all the boys did. Like, oh, we got them. Third quarter runs. That's what they're famous for. We got them. And they come out, and they come, and once they on, they on. It's hard. So you, it, it, it just, it's a testament to how great they are all around. People pay attention to the step back threes, KD's ability and all that. But they win, man, because they, they actually got a lot of Chicago Bulls in them. Steve Kerr definitely gave them a lot of movement the way they swarm on defense. The way the versatility using Draymond, he's basically playing the Pippen, you know, role, you know, being a point forward and stuff like that, which people don't understand that causes mismatches because the big has to stay out the lane to mm-hmm. deal with him. So that gives room for Steph and Clay and KD to roam. It's, it's really, it, it, I mean, and, and Kerr, you know, Kerr haven't got a lot of, you know, you know, uh, credit. credit, yeah, as far as like what he's done over the year because he's like, you got all that talent, just roll the balls out and win. That's exactly what they were talking about before the game started. Exactly. Absolutely not. He coached his butt off this year. I mean, even against Houston. And that's how I knew Draymond was good because, you know, Capella's more of a threat as far as the lobs and mm-hmm. obviously dealing with James and Chris Paul and those guys and Gordon. It, it's a threat. But when I saw him, dang, they averaged a triple-double against them and he disrupted them like that. I'm like, oh, he on a, he on a different level. Like, he's on a different level. So I knew Portland would be a breeze, man. I knew it would be a breeze, but yeah, ain't no be this breeze. Yeah, I know, I know. It ain't no disrespect to them. It's yeah. just it's deeper water this time. Exactly. Again, right? mm-hmm. And it's like perfect example not to keep harping on the like OKC, right? Mm-hmm. Paul George gave Dame that much space, right? Yeah. The Warriors, even being who they are, there's an appropriate sense of fear, right? Because of a scouting report, they've been there before. We're not giving you that space, mm-hmm. like not even a little bit. Like he 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 rarely had that type of room, like you said, Cardell. Love that you brought it up. To piggyback about that defense, right? Just Clay, 1.8 steals, 1.8 blocks. Dre, this is for the series. Dre, 2.3 steals, 2.8 blocks. Looney, 1.3 steals, one block a game. That's how annoying they were, disruptive. And that's not counting the McKinney's, the living I was going to say, and their bench stepped um, up for them to held it down. Before. And that's the other thing I hope people understand because you brought up that Steve doesn't get enough credit. This is how you know what you're doing as a coach to speaks volumes. If your bench players, your, your others can come in ready to go and they never look lost, that's a sign of a, co- a good mm-hmm. coach. But yeah, but it also goes back to matchup. Yeah. No disrespect. No, no. Like Portland, talent-wise, talent level, they don't have the experience of the Warriors bench, the championship experience one. And their talent level, I'm talking about the front court stars to the yeah. bench. It's not a gap. They're even. If not, if the Warriors don't even got them talent-wise with the experience. So they have the age. So this is the series to play your bench. Against Houston, that's a different animal. You got to deal with James and all that, and you couldn't afford. They get going. It's hell, especially, you know what I'm saying? So you can't take that chance. That's why they ain't play as much. So you got you to gotta get credit with, you know, credit is due, man. But, you know, it, it's just championship DNA. Mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. You know, that's, that's the best way I can sum it up. All right, to the other series that's currently 2-1, Milwaukee, Toronto. Before go we go here, I got some questions I want to ask y'all. Sure. But not rapid fire, just real questions. Okay. I know y'all hearing the, the noise about KD being better. Okay. The Warriors being better without KD. Yeah. What are y'all real thoughts on that? Not like hot take stuff, just like, do you feel like they, they don't need them, especially where, you know, LeBron, they don't have to face a LeBron in this, in this play around. Like, what are y'all thoughts on that? I think that's crazy. I think that's entirely crazy to say that a team is better without arguably the best player in the NBA at this time. Like, that's ridiculous. I just feel like what happens and people overlook it so much is that you have to adjust and you have to regroup when that best player is not there. Mm -hmm. So because they were able to regroup because they are a team and it's a team sport, they were able to still do what they need to do. That's no take. That's no knock on either side. That's no knock for the team that played without KD or the team that plays with KD. It's it's ridiculous. Um, KD is always going to be. It's going to make them better. That's not saying that they're not good without KD. That's why I don't understand where the big 
like divide and misconception is to think that it's the same thing we talked about when John Wall went out and everybody thought the Wizards were better without John Wall like it makes no sense you cannot say that and people want clicks to their site and, and say all these other crazy things just to kind of get people all riled up and stirred up that makes entirely no sense yeah um and just from a common sense standpoint I would like to say this it's been three years with KD right yeah. It's been it's been more years without him than with him, correct? Mm -hmm. So that former style comes much more natural to you than the newer style, correct? Mm -hmm. Just to throw that out there, make sure it's easy for everybody to follow. When you have a luxury like Kevin offensively, I wish people would listen to what these players actually say instead of going by everything else. It's easy to get lazy because the floor is a little bit different. You don't have to you don't have to do as you don't have to cut as hard or or work as hard to get free when he's on the floor because that changes the floor. Mm -hmm. The floor is much different now. He, he's getting the ball in the mid post. The, everything's at your will now, right? Because if you double, he can see you. He can pass over everything. And the other thing is you can't leave the shooters now. Now it's one-on-one -on -one for Clay. It's one-on-one -on -one for Steph. That changes things. Without him on the floor, you can load up on them. Mm -hmm. You know, you see Steph give up the ball, reco relocate yep. for like eight seconds to get free again. You don't have to do all that when that's on the floor. Exactly. Secondly, are you, I wish people, again, but I, I get it because it's the same group of people that don't understand what this team is defensively. Do you understand what Kevin does for them defensively? You literally get to have, like, a couple versions of Draymond Green. It's another, it's a seven-foot disruptor, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen in this last three years where there's times where, in the past, a Draymond would have to go put out a fire, right? And that changes the defense because if he's putting out a fire on the perimeter, the help side's kind of different now, mm -hmm. right? Because he's kind of their small ball, small ball five. When Kevin's out there, we saw in the Houston series and other series, he can go out there and do that. And Dre's still able to do what he does best, which is captain the defense from the back end, play safety, and it it just makes everything better. I don't understand why this is so difficult to comprehend. Because people just look at the flash, and obviously for me, they re they have their little favorite teams and their their favorite players. They realize with these guys together, they have no chance. Mm -hmm. So it's much better to try to disrupt that, get guys trading and stuff like that. But it's like what you said, even with Steph, and I love Steph. He's yeah. not a better player than Kevin. I mean, than Kevin Durant. It's just, it's just common sense. You know, I love how he can score and all that. But it's been times he struggles when the teams focus on him. Damn them couldn't do it because they had so much on their plate. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And they retired because it, when I mean like they weren't built for this. I'm not saying like heart wise. I'm talking about. Fatigue-wise, mm -hmm. they're, they're tired. They went seven games. And, and truth be told, the Nuggets are more talented than the Blazers. They just don't know how to win yet. This is their first playoff time. That's what I mean by experience. They don't know yet. Just like Portland, this is their first time getting this league. They don't understand championship basketball yet. The Warriors, this is easy. This, this is second nature. This is what they do year-round. So that's the difference. But Kevin Durant, to say they don't need him, who put the James Harden in the fire when he was murdering everybody out there on the Warriors? He the one that got on him in the fourth quarter and slowed him down where the Warriors can come back and win and stuff like that. He does that every game. And then he's obviously most efficient player in basketball. That's why he's the best scorer. It's 35. He don't need a lot of shots to give you 35. He's and he and, and Patrick Beverly, that, that press conference pretty much summed things up with him and Lou Williams, with Pat Beverly and Lou Williams. And then, like you said, the defensive end, the versatility, guarding on basically one through five at times. You know, helping Draymond the way they swarm and stuff like that. That's a luxury that none of those other players, even Draymond to a certain extent, they cannot do. So you have to give credit where it's due. To say that they're better without him, it just was crazy to me. And it's like, it's funny how y'all just forget they went and got him for the deal, the deal with the dude from Akron. Because couldn't nobody on that team deal with him. So you got to respect that. And he, he dealt with him. So you wouldn't be all this three-time champion if it wasn't for him. So give that dude respect where he deserves and everything like that and, and just roll with it. Stop hating. Because the same thing, and it sounds like these, it's these uh, blind witnesses, though. It sounds like it's mostly them talking. <laughs> and it's just, if you a true bad over you got to respect what they're doing because it's not like they just out there just out talent everybody. They're, win they're being tested, and they're finding a way to overcome. You got to respect it. I mean, but again, again, like why it's annoying, but you can't be shocked. The same people that, you know, remember Golden State blew the 30 point lead against the Clippers? Yeah. And that thought Kevin not shooting enough was the issue. Mm. And then they pissed him off and he was like, Y'all know who I am. All right, bet. But, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, you don't go by 30, right, with that formula mm -hmm. and blow the lead because someone stopped shooting. Y'all just stopped playing. Mm -hmm. that, that's a that's an everyone thing. They were up 30 
with someone taking nine shots, and again, people ignore, there were 12 free throws, right? But the offense was running. Again, what makes them danger so dangerous is you got three of their best players to play without the ball, which even enhances the part you brought up about Draymond Being the playing point, point forward. forward because when he gets the board, now, one, you got to find the two light skin dudes, right? You, <laughs> nah, just keep it a buck. You have to find them. And it was a couple great times where Kevon Looney got easy buckets because Draymond's pushing the pace so fast, right? Mm-hmm. And the defense is scrambled. Oh, my gosh, where's Steph? Oh, my God, where's Clay? They got your back to him. What you learning off top? Stop ball, right? Mm-hmm. No one's stopping ball. Kevon Looney goes, you know, I'm going to go set a screen. My man, my man Myers Leonard, I'm, no one's going to stop. It's because bigs are not taught to yeah. pick up the ball. They're taught to run basket to basket, yeah. meet that man at the block to try to stop the position. So they like, oh shoot, I got Draymond. It's they've been taught that from as soon as they picked up a basketball. Oh, so that's you, natural. You think a lot of the things you like to play them to beat them, you gotta like reprogram a lot of the the, the, the conventional things exactly. you're taught, right? And even with the guards, CJ and Dane, like you said, Steph and Clay are always moving and moving. That ties you out if you were defensive. I know a lot of people don't like to play defense, so they don't understand this. When they get but when you're dealing with guys, yeah, when you chasing them. That's tiring because mm-hmm. they never stop moving. And Steph is a great screen setter. They set screens. They tough. They stand there. They send screens. And you think you got you? They slow down. They stop. You think all right, cool. Pew, oh shoot! And then you gotta wake up next thing. And they don't need much space. They're quick shooters. It's hell. And then I mean, just look at like it was one play I saw on Twitter with um, I think uh, Looney set a back screen yeah. and Seth was going to Steph. And the bench was like, yo, yo, what? Like, waving him, like, no, wrong angle, wrong angle. And, but he had his back turned, so he didn't see him. Mm-hmm. So he literally was backpedaling, and they see the screen. He got a screen. Steph shot the jump. The whole bench just said, and it went in. They, they, the whole coaching staff players, everybody was like, oh. I got another they ain't even wait for it to go in. I got another one for you. Late in the game, I don't know if you remember this. They were running out of bounds play. Got the clay. It looked like it was supposed to be a handoff to somebody. Mm-hmm. Clay turned to the handoff and then turned back to the defense and fired the three. Oh, yeah, I say that. You know what I'm saying? Because they don't need that much room. How the heck do you deal with that type of, like they're killers, that type of, you know. Just the light skin, man. You want to talk about like fatigue, too. Steph played the whole second half. But, like but, you said, but who was testing them? <laughs> that's the other thing. You have to be able to put, like, stress on them defensively. And, and that's, what the, and that's why they t- – and that's when they get tested. When you got to mm-hmm. deal with the Kyrie's, the James Harden, Chris Paul, that's when they had their off games. Mm-hmm. KD can play D, and he – I'm still going to give you third. That's the difference. And – like, they, they do a good job behind the stuff. Like, all right, look, he, he has his times, but I'm serious. Did you see yeah, They, they, they went on Harkless. They, look, he lighting you up, and they ain't lying. Let me go back on him, but he on Harkless. You yeah. got Clay on you. Here comes Draymond with the trap. You frustrated, though. You like, my God. And Looney waiting in the wing, like, just in case you get by. Yeah, yeah. and you got your red cold bow getting down there in the paint because you they ain't got to guard nobody really either. It's just hell. It's just like, come on. So they looking at Dame. I'm like, yeah, y'all go out there and try to beat that defense. And... If you and CJ don't, like I said, before we even when the series started, I said, him, Dame and CJ going to have to average 30, and some of them other guys are going to have to step up, and that still might not be enough. And, and I believe I said Draymond was going to go dumb this series, and I think we all agree because he literally had no responsibilities in the front court. There's no responsibilities. Not to be mean, just being honest. Like you said, there wasn't a big that they played through. Mm-hmm. So you get to run around, be free safety, and as someone who's as disruptive as this, it's a dream come true. Mm-hmm. So, all right, so shout out the time. We having fun tonight. All right. Yeah. So to the Bucks and the Raptors, it's 2-1 Milwaukee. Just some thoughts on that before we take a break. Seven. It's going to be tough. I, I thought it would be closer than it, it has been. Mm-hmm. Um, but Toronto got to get it together. They've been still not giving them that much. Giannis is still having his way. Kawhi's been slightly off. Um, mm-hmm. And if they if they going to – I mean, I can still see it going seven games just because of how talented Kawhi is and how I feel like he can rally his team behind him. But it's going to be tough, you know, especially now 0-2, you know, bringing it to 2-1. And this game tonight is, like – must win because if they, I feel like if they don't win this game tonight, they gonna go back to um, get closed out. Yeah, they gonna get closed out when they go back. Like they have to win this game. They need this game and if they feel like they they gonna you know be able to get over them and get past them. But uh, Giannis hasn't slowed down at all, and we've talked about that all year as well. Like we talk about Draymond's uh, motor. Giannis got a motor too, and he don't stop. He don't quit. You know, if he gotta adjust something, he gonna adjust it. And I love that he takes 
all criticism, all you know, media questions, whatever it is, he takes the responsibility. He is truly their leader, and I love the fact that he leads that way by, you know, through words, through actions, and still on the court. So, I mean, it's going to be tough for them. They, they need Kawhi to come through, um, and everybody else got to step up if they're going to win it out. But the way it's looking, Giannis just looked like he got a look in his eye, and he, he ready to go. So, it's going to be tough. Garnell? I mean, um, the Bucks definitely have the edge. Um, they lost last game because they couldn't make shots. Um, they just had a uh, whatever cold shooting game, like Meritick shooting 27%, 14% from three. I mean, Greek free 31% from the field. He shot 28% from free throw line. Middleton, uh, the other all star 18% from the field, 16% from three. Bledsoe, same exact numbers. It, it, that, that's that was like crazy like you you won't see that again not from all of those players but at the same time they still had a chance to win that's why it's like is this hard man because they went to two overtime and they still could have won but that's credited to their bench you know malcolm brogdon at 20 points brooke lopez stepped up with 16.6 mm-hmm. rebounds george hill been balling 24.7 <laughs> rebounds Kawhi willed him he had 36 but it was inefficient but you know to me shock him and marcus saw their production you know Gasol was 16 12 and 7 shock him with 25 and 11, as well as Norman Powell off the bench with 19 mm. points. That's what won the game at the end of the day. And um, I, it's just about making shots. I mean, you, if it's hard to make shots, you know, it's hard to win. But like I said, they're such a great defensive team. It kept them in the game. It kept forcing overtime. That's why I say defenses, you got to emphasize defense first, then offense. But Toronto's bench been MIA pretty much since Philly. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why. And you start to show the starters. They feel like they got pressed and do so much, which is exactly what the Bucks want you to do. If the Bucks made their shots, it's just 3-0. So they're not going to be that off again. So, you know, I mean, I mean right now, man, I mean, they they got to figure out something. That bench got to come to play. That's it. Because right now, Lowry got his hands. He's getting outplayed by George Hill and those guys. And Aaron Brogdon, they throwing so many bodies at Kawhi. They making him inefficient. I mean, Shockham had finally had a good game as well. It's all, but... I mean, right now, I just can't see them, unless their bench wake up, they have no chance. You know, the Raptors have no chance. So, you know, we'll see. I agree with you guys hard. I mean, not much to add. Uh, it's a struggle sometimes when you have that guy. Like, the Raptors have their guy, but there's not another creator. Mm-hmm. And and that's tough. Like, it, it really hurts where, you know, what comes off of Milwaukee's bench, you got a couple guys get their own shot and get some somebody, somebody else. And that's a big thing, especially come this time of year. All right, so we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we got some DC United. After that, we got that 9450 breakdown from Jamal Hayward. Look forward to sharing that with you guys. And a little bit of rapid fire you're watching the Focus TV. Welcome back to the Focus TV. Oh, man, very fun first half of the show. A lot, lot of talk in the NBA statement. Um, D.C. United, uh, not the result they wanted last week on the road in Houston. They fell 2-1 after taking a 1-0 lead in the 46th minute. Still, you know, they're 7-4-3. They're That's just one loss behind the first place Philadelphia Union. But tomorrow night, some fun. It's a friendly match. When D.C. United hosts Real Betis, this will be the first meeting between the two teams. And it will mark the first time Real Betis will play a friendly in the United States. The La Liga side are 2-2-1 in their last five matches. They finished the 2018-2019 La Liga season in 10th place with a record of 14-8-16. Should be good times. Um, got some nice, exciting games coming out in the next few months. Got the U.S. national team at one point. And DC United has another international friendly, I believe, in July. So, you know, the black and red, uh, it's a long season, but they're still near the top of the table. Right. Can't really ask for much more than that. After the friendly tomorrow night, they will be on the road this weekend when they take on the New England Revolution, who have a new coach, former U.S. men's national team, um, you know, legend Bruce Arena. So, you know, tune in tomorrow night. Come out to Audi Field tomorrow night and then tune in this weekend as well. <coughs> but Jamal Hayward with the 9 4 50. Breakdown this week is a mid-post option. Fake middle spin back into the Dirk fadeaway with some very highly skilled scores that NBA have adopted. Shout out to Dirk. 
It's a mid post option, fake middle spin, back to the, to the dirt fadeaway. We'll see you guys after the break. No dribble on the first official move. Step, big step into the lane, okay? Shot fake. So it's here. Shot fake. Hit it with the left foot. Now you spin back. So it's not a narrow spin. Here. Wide spin. Step back. Up. Drop. Go. All one motion. Big step. Pump fake. Up. So when you take that dribble here, on that spin back, lean into the defender. Get separation. No dribble on the first ignition move. Step, big step into the lane, okay? Shot fake. So it's here. Shot fake. Hit it with the left foot. Now you spin back. So it's not a narrow spin. Here, wide spin. Step back, up, drop, go. All one motion. Big step, pump fade, up. So when you take that dribble here, on that spin back, lean into the defender. Get separation. Welcome back to the Focus TV. As always, shout out to Jamal Hayward over at 9450. Thank you so much for wonderful installment each and every week. So now to Cardell's favorite part of the show. Talking that, that wreck, man. John Wick <laughs> part of the show. All right. Uh, uh, first question is, um, how devastating is Ruben Foster's ACL injury for Washington? I mean, theoretically, it should be, but... In reality, I don't think it should be that devastating if they are saying that, you know, we never knew when he was going to get on the field. So, to me, they shouldn't have been game planning for him anyway. But, I mean, it's got to hurt to think you get a steal and all of a sudden that steal is gone in 2.5 seconds. So, I think it's devastating along the lines that it's another big injury that they have to deal with, you know, on the heels of – Alex Smith and Cole McCoy, and then, you know, of course they had what Darius Geis last year, all the injuries that they've had over this past season. Um, so I think it's devastating in that aspect, but I mean, if, if if they are, if they were doing what they said they were doing, I don't think they should have been game planning, planning for him to play anyway. To be just, to be completely honest, just like the facts so far, whether it be suspension or injury, the kid hasn't had a chance to realize his potential in the NFL. Um, so, as Octavia said, there's, it, as great as it, as it was to get him, as a steal, obviously, on a discount due to, what, you know, the things that have happened, you should have had, like, you should have probably been focused on getting someone from behind him. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the type of situation where, yes, you have Ruben, but plan for in not case Ruben's Ruben. not there. Because of, you know, just the yeah, past history. history yeah. You know, his, his history dictates that you have to have someone for just in case. And this is a situation where I hope they can find someone because ideally, had he been healthy, he was going to give them, he had, he had the potential to give them something in the middle of that defense that they haven't had for quite a while mm -hmm. and something that they greatly needed. That being said, I'm interested to see how they try to fill this gap mm -hmm. um, with, you know, the news that is broken. Carson Wentz uh, is expected Everybody's to be on the field. Oh, Lord Jesus. Lies. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. We have no limitations for on-field drills, no organized team activities, uh, according to Ian Rappaport from the NFL Network. Everybody remember Wentz went down with a back injury last season, mm -hmm. and it's the second straight year he has dealt with that injury. Um, thoughts? Look, if they say it, I'm ready. I believe it. <laughs> Let's go. I've been waiting for this day for so long for him to be fully cleared. 
Um, I just hope that it is that he's fully cleared. I just don't, I hope it's not, you know, trying to rush him back or, which I don't think it is because if that was a fact, I feel like they would have tried that last year instead of starting Nick Foles last year. So I don't think that they would do that. I really think that they are taking into consideration that they feel like he's going to be their, their guy for um, the next couple of years to come. So um, I hope it's true. I hope he's rehab, you know, as much as he needs to and that he is really ready to go because, like I said, I don't know why backup is. I'm not even saying y'all, – y'all keep disrespecting my man, though. Um, he need to ask for a trade. I mean, I hope he's so bad. Like, no. For the sake of the franchise because that's a really big piece. Yeah, yeah exactly. definitely, yeah. We, it's, we it's, need uh, that. You know, it's one of those things, especially when it, you can't have him on field. Right. It definitely keeps you from, you know, ideally everybody – you know, that's one of the most important pieces. You want to build around him when you have him young. It was kind of like the, the best years to have them because you're pretty much paying your peanuts, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, so you want to maximize that time in the, in the league where you rarely get paid, um, at least not real money, because if they don't want you, they get to do what they did to Gerald McCoy this week and just cut them for the, for the low, low, keep the 13 million they would have made and keep it moving. So it's, you hope that he's healthy. Um, but again, going back to like the Ruben Foster situation, looking at that past history, the backups need to be ready. Yeah, that's you know, what for, I said. for just in case. <laughs> Damian Lillard, uh, Trailblazers are expected to sign him to the Supermax, uh, four years, $193 million. Uh, worth it? Yes. Um, I say yes on for different reasons. One, number one of how he's played his first playoff. over these last years. Um, nobody was checking for Portland uh, a couple years ago. I remember when I first really started paying attention to Portland, when it was still Dame, it was Wes Matthews, LaMarcus Aldridge, um, and I can't think of the last person, but all that happened and in the split second, his entire starting five was gone. He was the only one left. And to see how he has picked that franchise up, he's become more of a leader and he has, you know, elevated them into the conversation now. I definitely think he's worth it. I think that that's, they should realize that that is their franchise. They need to keep him. They need to build around him because he, he's what keeps them going. You know, like, so I definitely think, you know, we always talk about contracts in the NBA and all this money and everything and if it's deserved. Um, if they got it, they need to give it to him. That's how I feel. It's one of those weird situations. You know how sometimes in sports you see a guy be like, oh, they're so-and-so, like, they, they embody that franchise, he's a blazer. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a no-brainer in this situation. Um, but it's kind of twofold for me. One, give the man what he's due because you can't, you can't really just solely quantify what he means to the Blazers from just an on-court standpoint. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the, the second part of this, you need to continue to build around him so you maximize his, you know, the time that you have. Prime, yeah. Prime. So that, that's, why, that's the only reason it's twofold for me is, yeah, obviously he deserves the money. But the biggest thing is, you know, we've seen other situations where you give somebody the money, but you don't necessarily, the front office doesn't necessarily continue to hold their end of the bargain by surrounding mm -hmm. said person with the corresponding pieces to maximize, you know, that window in which you gave said person. Exactly. That much money. Because I'm sure he wouldn't mind taking less money for more quality players around him because you can tell the type of guy he is. He want to win. No, nah, you don't got, and it, this ain't the NFL, the NBA, you don't need to take less money. Mm -hmm. They just need to put the money up. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He dang sure that's why he, he deserves his money in case they be on some BS and yeah. don't bring in talent. At least he went into something. You know what I'm saying? He got his value. And that's why I feel like players, when you earn the right, where they, you know, they give you a certain amount, they offer you a certain amount, you take it. You know what I'm saying? Forget what the public think or whatever like that because when they're done, they're done with you. And they're not going to, it's not going to be ceremonious or nothing. They're not going to be, hey, man, we get you on the back end. And we, like you said, what he means to that franchise, not just that franchise, that city, that mm -hmm. community, uh, all that, you know, he's been stand up. And I love the fact that he's winning because it, 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 it rewards loyalty. I understand that some teams and some owners are, you know, funny mm -hmm. or whatnot, but loyalty got to work both ways. Mm -hmm. And you can't expect teams to be loyal to the players and stuff like that. If it, it, it's a two-way street, it got to be mutual respect. You re, you know you, you recognize what each other is doing, come together, and y'all try to ride it out and do something that's not that haven't been done since Bill Walton was there, and just try to bring a championship there. They made this a Western Conference Final. All they got to do is get a couple pieces up front that can produce offense or whatever. They're gonna they learn from this. I know they're gonna make another leap. Experience wise, because look at the leap they made from last year when they got swept with Anthony Davis and Drew Holiday and those guys. 
I know they're going to get in the gym and get better, so they're going to be even more dangerous. And all they got to do is get another piece, cancer, be back. Just get another piece up front where guys got the – you got to guard them and they be back in the mix. So they'll be, they'll be fine. Uh, reports are Heat assistant coach and former Wolverine great Juwan Howard is expected to be named Michigan head coach. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's amazing. Um, I feel like he's been grinding as an assistant coach for years now. Um, you can't deny his basketball IQ. And, you know, if he's been producing as a coach the way that it seems he has, I think it's definitely well due. He definitely deserves a shot, you know, to prove, you know, if nobody thinks so right now, but prove his worth at being a head coach. So I think it's a great look for him. Uh, it's about time. Mm -hmm. um, you put in the work, uh, he deserves the opportunity. Um, kudos for Michigan for looking past all the other crap that involves, you know, that, that that stuff with them in the Fat Five. Um, hopefully they can find it to a place where all that's all the way taken care of um, because I'm not a fan of it. But he deserves the opportunity and congrats to him. I'm eager to see what he ends up doing out there. I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. Like you said, you've been grinding on the sidelines for day, you know, all day. Um, Chicago roots, uh, son came up recently. He has a son that came up, you know, in college or whatnot. Uh, so he had his ties to the AU. He was connected. Obviously, he's watching his son grow up. And I think even deeper than, than you know him just getting on the sideline, X's and O's, it's the first pillar into acknowledging the Fab Five again, um, which is probably, you know, in, I wouldn't say the most successful one because they obviously won championships before, but definitely the most popular run. Like that, that I mean, nothing touched the Fab Five mm -hmm. when they was in school. So I think this is the first domino to fall. Once you get them in there, then obviously more talks will come. And then obviously you got to get the inner stuff out of the way with, between Webb and Jalen mm -hmm. Rose and the guys. And then they'll be back. And then you, you, you'll see an influx of talent coming back through there. And it's not like they were behind. Obviously, b like did a great job. Yeah. And that's with the Cavs. I mean, you just got to keep it real. You know, but you see in the wave of former NBA players starting to get their opportunity in college. You see Stackhouse down to Vanderbilt. You see, uh, obviously, Penny in Memphis. Juwan Howard, um, you know, if the reports are facts, you know, he getting a job in Michigan. And it will only help your program, you know what I'm saying? I love the fact that those guys put in work, you know, even Stackhouse on the G League level, they put in work before they were rewarded with these things. And I think that's where a lot of former players are missing. They feel like, I was a former player, I should know more than you at that level and all that, and I should just automatically walk in and get it. It ain't like that, mm -hmm. like, that's playing. That's why I try to tell a lot of people, I'm like, cool, you used to, whatever you used to be, that don't matter now. You got to put your pay your dues right now because it's different. Like, you know, we had Lewis on, you know, yeah. all the success he has to play. He went overseas where he is. He came back. He didn't even know how to, he a coach. He didn't even know how to connect to try to get players. He had to learn that. I, I went through the same shock. I'm like, hold on, what are all these AAU teams? It's just like, what, what happened? <laughs> and in a few years, I just like, was at high school like five years ago? What, what, you know, it, it changes quick. So if you ain't connected to, you know, everything, it, it can be tough. So he paid dues. Obviously, he has had success. He's, you know, highly respected throughout basketball. We know what he meant to the university. It's number wins across the board. So. Um, last question, uh, Adam Silver, you know, he said uh, LeBron James leaving the East hurts TV ratings uh, and it's a possibility they, the NBA could start West Coast games earlier. Here's his quote, face it, LeBron is one of the biggest stars in the world and he also played in the East. And so the reason I took a, a look a little bit tired is a lot of our games are in the West and it's late at night and I recognize most people choose to go to sleep at a reasonable time. And so from a rating standpoint, not having LeBron in the playoffs, not having him in the East has clearly impacted ratings. 50% of television households in this country are in the Eastern Times. And so, and so if your West Coast game start at 10.30 at night in the East, you're invariably going to lose a lot of viewers around 11, 11.30. I mean, you can just chart it. You see how I many television households turn off around 11, 15, 11.30 at night just because people have to get up for work in the morning. I mean, it is something we can address. We're talking about, I mean, we will obviously be less convenient to those fans on the West Coast if we played even earlier. I mean, just think about people getting to those arenas after work if you start a game at 6 p.m., local time in the West. It's not the most convenient thing. It's not as convenient for a television watcher on the West Coast either. But when you look at the league from a national standpoint, it may make sense to play a little bit early in the West, and that's something we're going to talk to our teams about this summer. Thoughts? I think it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, 
I be tired and I be mad when I wake up the next morning and something amazing happened and I missed it. So I get it. Um, I see it from two sides. One side of me as a basketball player is like, like I don't care about ratings. Like that, that's I, I could care less about ratings, honestly. Um, but I get it that basketball, the NBA is a business and they are going to look at ratings and they're going to look at how they can fix it. And I, I mean, it's going to be a catch 22 either way they go. Like he said, um, for West Coast people that watch the games and, and those things and having to move time earlier for them, I get that. But if the numbers do show that more people in the East Coast, I mean, it only makes logical sense to try to at least adjust it in a, to a certain point. To a certain extent, you know, even if they start by certain games, like big mar marquee games that they, they know that a lot of people want to watch, even if they just start with, like, trying to move those a little bit earlier and, you know, have it so already it's already planned out before the season starts. So that way even people in the West, like, okay, I know, like, if I want to go to this game today, like, I might have to switch some things around so I can get there at this time. Um, it, to me, it, it's a logical question and it is definitely something that I appreciated they're looking into because I show be tired when them games start at ten thirty. Yeah, I think you brought up pretty much all the you know, that there's two sides of it. Um, both for the viewers and the players. Um, I think like obviously you're gonna have to find a happy medium. I don't think this is something you can just wholesale change mm -hmm. in one off season. Mm -mm. I think um, not to say this is a good idea, but at least just popped in my head like Octavia said. Uh, you already know which teams are games are nationally televised, right? Heading into the year, move those around. Don't move the other things around. Right. Because I don't see any reason to move. Like, if Memphis is playing Sacramento, right? Let us leave. And that's not the knock the team, but that's, that's probably great. not a nationally televised game, mm -hmm. right? So let that be a league pass game, and everything continue as normal. If it's something huge where you know everybody's gonna watch, cool. Maybe move that around. I like. The flex with with football sometimes mm -hmm. Sunday night late in the schedule, but it's something that's being done gradually, and I hope they don't just rush it and do it too quickly, and then you know have to go back. And I just hope they take their time. And I mean, the reality is, it's you no know, no basketball people. Yeah. But the reality is, there are more casual fans than basketball fans. You know, like people that's in basketball that know basketball, they're more casual fans. So for them, they're just coming for the excitement of seeing certain players. Mm -hmm. But for me. It comes back to how about you start market, you know, not taking a shot at someone, market other players better. Yeah. Where the casual fans recognize and know who they are more. Now, some of it got to be on the players. I always like Kawhi. He's quiet. He don't really like to do the media thing. So I have a talk with him. I understand, yo, this is a responsibility. Mm -hmm. This is what you signed up for when you became a professional. You know what I mean? Same thing with, you know, Greek Freak is more talk of, talkative and everything like that, but he can still do more market these extraordinary players that are playing at a high level and these fans will want to tune in yep. and see these great players play because it's overload with lebron he ain't even a player and it's not a dang hate but it's just reality it's overload he ain't even a playoff so we still talking about him. whereas if other players ain't the playoff yeah, yeah who are they so and yeah. i understand he, he he's a great player and all that but the league will carry on you know they carried on from magic bird carried on from jordan and carried on from shack and coke Duncan, all those it's going to keep carrying on. There's other great stars. It's just up to the lead to really pump them where the casual fans know who they are. So if, if the ratings are down, it's because they ain't really heard about Kawhi. It's, I mean, think about it. First thing you get on ESPN is something about the Lakers or LeBron all year. But meanwhile, Greek Freak and Kawhi and them killing. So you got to – they should be first. They, the they earn that right. And them, it, yeah. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So – it's plenty of stars and stuff like that if you if you want to. I mean, hell, the Knicks get more pub than the Bucks and all them, and they're just trash. Just think about it. So it's about what media and everything, what they put out there. I think that's a great – like, that is a wonderful point because, for example, since the beginning of this playoffs, so many people were shocked by some of the teams out west where – If you were paying they, they attention. Were consistent, like, the Clippers were consistently from the beginning of the year. And that's – and that's what you see on Twitter. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's basketball people like, yo, shut up. It's casual people who want to talk like they know. It's like, shut up. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. That's the, top, the battle. The Clippers were like atop the West at one point in the year. Yeah. yeah. Like, so from, was Denver. Like, like so was the, Exactly. Like, from the beginning. <laughs> I'm telling you, so was Denver. Yeah. Anything else that you said? I think that's a great point, though. It, it is. Because even think about like, it in this instance. In this, like, in today's climate. Yeah, think about this. The Warriors, how many times throughout the season were the Warriors bumped? because of the drama out in L.A. and LeBron, and they're the champs. 
Right. With all that star power. Right. It makes no sense. So that's on the lead. They got to, back in the day, you got marketed if you was winning. Like, you was trash. Uh, you know, we catch up with you. But it was Magic of Bird because they was in the finals every year. I see no lies in that statement. At all. And, and I think that's the thing is, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's another example of things getting away from. Substance. Yeah, substance to, to the other stuff. <laughs> and like literally, and again, not to knock that whole situation in LA, people in LA, but um, talk about an off season, man, I don't care, you didn't make the playoffs. Like, we just like, why, like, obviously, you, whether you hate the words, love the words or whatever, like, Talk about that. Talk about Toronto. Talk about whatever. Talk about Portland. Talk about you know. Houston. Portland season oh my God, it's all the people Even in the talk play. about Houston, but all season stuff. Stop it. Like we're not like in my mind, we're not gonna bring up the dysfunctional Knicks. We'll bring up the dysfunctional Lakers. Nobody cares right Think now. about it. Playoffs. So, have you heard anything about the Wizards? They're not in the playoffs. Franchise needs a lot of work right now. Hawks. Don't have a GM. Hawks, Orlando, like, and that's what I'm saying. We can go down the list of all these teams in the league. But this is that time of the year, like you said, let those teams shine if you get a better job all throughout the year of highlighting those players. Like, as you mentioned as well, Denver didn't sneak up on anybody. The Clippers didn't sneak up on everybody. Paid attention from the beginning of the year to the end, like you said, the casual fan. Do a better job informing and educating them. Let them know if you want. How about you flip the content? Like, on the East Coast on some nights, show us nothing but the West Coast commercials. You know what I'm saying? Like, literally show us the West Coast players. Same thing on the opposite coast. And, and homeboys trying to stop kissing said players. Behind. Ass. Yes, <laughs> like it's real. That's just the reality of it, you know. That Jackie McMullen piece when she asked people about All NBA, and and some of the writers were like I can't go against such and such player because it's gonna it's gonna hurt me, man. You know he he's my military. Like that's horrible. You gotta tell it like it is. And if and these casual fans are reading what you're writing or listening to what you're, you're saying on TV. Bible. Shaping these Narr- yeah, like, narrative. You're, you're shaping the narratives. It to me is just irresponsible. But want to thank you guys for tuning in. As always, Cardell, thank you for the great, great rapid fire questions. As always, get over to finestmag.com. Get over to mymommysports.com. And each and every Tuesday, you know, unless we say otherwise, <laughs> tune in right here to Bliss.fm to see the focus on DCTV.